Test 3. The test is split into four sections, sections 1, 2, 3 and 4. You need to listen to the recordings and answer the questions in your book. The recordings will be played once only. At the start of each section, you will be given time to read the questions. At the end of the test, you have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Please turn to Section 1, Test 3. Section 1, Test 3. You will hear a conversation between a camper wishing to make a reservation on a campsite and the campsite's manager. First, you have some time to look at questions 161 to 166. Hello, is that the Goodnight Camping and Caravan Park? Yes it is, how can I help? Well, I need to know more about your facilities. OK, we have over 80 pitches, including 20 for caravans. The site has a large kitchen and dining area, toilet and shower facilities, also a laundrette and electricity points. A simple grass pitch is fine, but can I bring a dog? Yes, this is a dog-friendly site. You can bring up to two dogs per pitch, free of charge. What else would you like to know? Are campfires and barbecues allowed? Yes, they are, but only on the riverbank, away from the tents. Well, uh, do I need to book in advance or can we just turn up? You don't need to make a reservation, but we do recommend it for bank holiday weekends and also for large groups of 20 or more. Well, there are only four of us, but I'd like to go ahead and book anyway. Do I book over the phone or online? The easiest way is via the website. Right. Do you accept credit cards? Yes, we accept credit cards, debit cards and PayPal. If you prefer not to pay online, you can make a booking by forwarding a cheque for £20, enclosing details of the dates you want and the number of pitches you need. I'm afraid we cannot refund the deposit if you cancel. And what was the tariff again, please? I mean per night. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I forget that. It's £8 per head per night which includes access to all the facilities. OK, well, that seems straightforward enough. Now, can you supply firewood? Yes, we do. It's £3 per night, or you can bring your own. Right. Um, all I need now is your web page address. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 166 to 170. Do you have a pen and paper to take down the web page details? Yes, I'm ready. Our website is www.goodnightpark.uk.com with Goodnight Park written as one word. Have you got that? Yes, thanks. Oh, I almost forgot. Can you tell me the dates when the park is open, please? Right, we open for the summer season on the 1st of June and close on the last day of September. And can we arrive at any time of day? You need to call in at the reception office between the hours of 8am and 4pm and if you have booked online, you can turn up as late as half past nine in the evening. Well, that's useful to know. We'll be travelling by coach and then by bus. We hope to arrive by three o'clock in the afternoon, but we could be delayed by traffic. Looking at the map, it's a journey of at least 100 miles. Where did you say you were travelling from? It's Chester. Do you know it? Not very well, but I think you'll use the M5 motorway for most of the journey. OK, there's just one last thing, really. Can I have the postcode and the GPS coordinates of the park, if possible, please? Well, I don't have the GPS coordinates to hand, but they are on the website. The postcode is GL27JN. If you put it into a sat-nav, it will get you to within 200 metres of the park. OK, I'll do that. It's a Gloucester postcode, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Fine. I have all the information I need. I'll book online later today. Thanks for your help. Hope to see you in a few weeks. Bye for now. See you when you arrive. Bye. That is the end of Section 1, Test 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 2, Test 3. You will hear a volunteer coordinator speaking to a group of conservation volunteers about the programme of work for the weekend. First, you have some time to look at questions 171 to 177. Hi everyone, it's great to see so many new volunteers here this weekend. We have a wide variety of outdoor work planned, all aimed at improving the countryside and protecting the natural habitat. Don't worry if you haven't done this type of work before, because we'll show you exactly what to do. Also, we've got Dave Pritchard with us today, who'll help us to repair the dry stone walls and paths. Now, I must point out that some of the work is quite difficult and may not be suitable for everyone. So we've decided to split the work into three levels of difficulty. OK, grades 1, 2 and 3. Grade 1 is light work, grade 2 is moderate work and grade 3 is heavy work. I hope that makes sense to everyone. You can always switch groups if you're not happy. OK, we need some volunteers to help to clear away Himalayan balsam. It's one of several species here that are not native to this country. It looks like bamboo. This is grade 1 work so it only needs a low level of fitness. Can I have a show of hands for this job, please? Almost anyone can do this work. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four. OK, that's five people for clearing bamboo. Is there anyone else? No? Now, litter and rubbish are a major problem in this area. Tidying it up will take a moderate amount of effort. The main task is litter picking, and if there is enough time, clearing vegetation from the paths. Do I have two volunteers, please? Right, it's that lady there and the man with the hat. Thank you. Remember, this is grade two work. That requires an average level of fitness. Are you okay with that? Right, the rest of the group can help with fencing, walling and access paths. Now, fencing is grade two work, but building walls is heavy grade three work. You will need to be very fit to do grade three work and you'll also need to be wearing protective footwear which means steel toe boots, not just any old shoes. If you don't have the right boots, then you'll have to help with the fencing and paths. We have 10 people left, so how many are happy to do the stone walling? Right, that's one, two, three, four, five, I count six. Please be careful and work at a steady pace. You'll need to save some energy for the tree planting tomorrow. Are there any questions? No? Then let's split into our groups and make the most of the fine weather. We'll stop at 11 o'clock for a cup of tea and a biscuit. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 178 to 180. Hi, I'm Dave and I'll be helping you repair this stretch of dry stone wall today. There are six volunteers, so if we can split into three groups of two people, that would be helpful. That gives us two people working at each end of the wall and two people working in the middle. Now we don't want to see one end of the wall going up quicker than the other. It's important to keep the wall level as it goes up, otherwise we'll end up with a problem in the middle. The largest rocks form the base of the wall, which is helpful because we don't have to lift them too far, but we'll also keep a few of the bigger ones for higher up. OK, if you look at this damaged section of wall, you can see that it's really two walls with a gap in between. The gap in the centre is filled with the smallest stones. These have a rounded shape and are known as hearting or packing stones. Don't just throw them into the wall. Place these packing stones carefully into the gap because they help to keep the other stones in place. The larger, long stones, like this one here, should be placed across the full width of the wall, from one face to the other. For appearance sake, try to keep the stones with the best looking faces for the outside of the wall. Right, 
Let's clear away some of these fallen stones so we don't trip over them, and then get started. That is the end of Section 2, Test 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3, Test 3. You will hear an interview with a student placement officer talking about work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions 181 to 185. Hello, Mike. Hi, Dave. Come in and take a seat. Thanks. Can you explain to our students how a work placement increases their chances of securing a job after they've graduated? Well, the most obvious thing to say here is that many graduates go on to work for the company that offered them the placement experience in the first place. Yes, I can see why this might happen. But in a more general sense, what are the benefits of a placement? Right. Placements give students a real insight into the culture of the workplace and how they can transfer their knowledge and skills to it. By drawing on placement experiences, graduates are able to sell themselves more effectively when applying for a job or compiling a CV. And at the interview stage, graduates appear more confident and can express themselves in a language appropriate to their chosen career. OK, fine. And what about the employer's perspective on work placements? How do employers benefit? Employers can see how a prospective employee performs within a team, also whether they are a good communicator and problem solver. It's a job with duties and responsibilities at a level that an undergraduate should cope with. Work placements help employers to recruit the right person for the job. And what about when the student returns to college at the end of the placement? What advantages does the work experience bring to college work? Well, the majority of students find their placements to be positive learning experiences. Work experience enables students to make links between theory and practice, which should facilitate academic learning. Right, and just one last thing on placements. What about mentorship and support during the work placement? Each student has a mentor in the workplace and a placement tutor, an academic member of staff who makes regular visits to the workplace to discuss the student's progress and, if necessary, resolve any problems or issues. OK, thanks, Mike. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to read questions 186 to 190. Now, continuing with our theme of graduate employment, we're going to talk about soft skills, what they are, and why you need them. Mike, can you define what is meant by soft skills? Yes, soft skills are an extension of what I mentioned earlier when I spoke about team working and communication. It's not sufficient these days to have only the know-how. By that, I mean technical skills to do the job. Employers also look for personal qualities and interpersonal skills. And why are personal qualities so important in the business world? Well, employers want people that are going to add value to their business and not detract from it. Simple things like lack of punctuality, showing up on time and being dependable will always be important to any company, as are honesty and integrity. These personal characteristics are an inherent part of an individual's makeup and are difficult to change. Soft skills also include coping skills when faced with difficult situations and challenges. Again, Performance in these areas is linked with inbuilt traits. I see. And what about interpersonal skills? Can't these be improved with practice or training? Yes, they can, because it is possible to change the way that you interact with colleagues and customers, the ability to communicate effectively, both through speech and in your documentation, is at the core of interpersonal skills. Equally important is the ability to demonstrate respectful listening. And how will good soft skills help you in an interview situation? Soft skills are vital to a successful interview. The impression you create can play a large part in the decision to make a job offer or not. Employers need to know that you have the right attitude. Will you fit in? Are you a team player? Do you appear positive and enthusiastic? 
you must be able to make the necessary changes to market yourself in this way. Well, thanks, Mike. That's, uh, that's most interesting. That is the end of Section 3, Test 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4, Test 3. You will hear a lecturer talking about Charles Darwin and the Galapagos Islands. First, you have some time to look at questions 191 to 200. Today I'm going to talk about a man who explained how life on Earth evolved through a process of natural selection, the survival of the fittest. His name is Charles Darwin and he was born in England in 1809. Darwin's mother was the daughter of the renowned Staffordshire potter Josiah Wedgwood and his father was a wealthy doctor. Darwin's mother died when he was nine years old and his father sent him to boarding school. During vacations, Darwin would collect and study wildlife, especially insects. In 1825, Darwin attended the University of Edinburgh to study medicine. However, he lacked the aptitude for the subject, being more interested in botany. He joined a student natural history group, which introduced him to the science of geology. Darwin left medical school two years later without completing his training. Darwin's father was disappointed by his son's failure at Edinburgh and he sent him to Cambridge to study theology. He graduated from Cambridge in 1831, aged 22, but decided against becoming a clergyman, much to the dismay of his father. Whilst at Cambridge, Darwin had met a professor of botany who encouraged him to pursue his interest in natural history and later recommended him as a crew member on the Royal Navy mapping ship HMS Beagle. The ship embarked for South America in 1831, sailing from Plymouth, England. It dropped anchor in Brazil, Argentina, the Falkland Islands and Chile, before arriving at the Galapagos Islands in 1835. Here Darwin observed species of plants, birds and reptiles that were unique to the islands. The rest of the journey took in Sydney, Australia and Cape Town, South Africa, with stops in the Keeling Islands and Mauritius. The route back to England included a stop in the tropics of South America, where Darwin made further important discoveries. The journey took five years and enabled Darwin to study life on three continents, collecting plants, insects and rock samples, whilst taking notes and making drawings. In 1839, Darwin married his cousin Emma Wedgwood and they had ten children. He published the zoological findings of the HMS Beagle expedition between 1838 and 1843 in several parts covering birds, fossils, insects, reptiles and mammals. Darwin continued with his research into natural selection, culminating in his seminal work On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. The book was an overnight success, though it caused widespread controversy because its theories appeared to conflict with the accepted religious view of creationism. Nevertheless, Charles Darwin's theories gradually gained acceptance, and when he died in 1882, aged 73, he was honoured by being buried in Westminster Abbey. He will always be known as the father of evolution. 
Of all the places Darwin visited, it is the Galapagos Islands that are most associated with his theory of evolution. The islands lie in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Ecuador, South America. The word Galapago is Spanish for terrapin and it refers to a small edible turtle that Spanish sailors used as a food source. Darwin observed variations in turtles, reptiles, birds and other species unique to each island, suggesting that the animals had adapted to their specific environment. The distances between the islands were too large for the animals to interbreed, so they must have descended from a common ancestor. Darwin also found fossilised remains of creatures that were now extinct, consistent with a failure to adapt to changes in habitat. Darwin believed in the survival of the fittest, that is to say only those members of a species that were best adapted to their surroundings would survive. For example, the finches on the island had beaks of a different size and shape suited to their diet. Long pointed beaks to probe for grubs and to grab small seeds or wider sturdy beaks for cracking nuts and eating larger seeds. The extinction of animals not capable of competing for the food is vital to Darwin's theory of natural selection. That completes practice test three.